Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, and I'm excited to be reviewing these two wines today. Before we get started, if you're enjoying the knowledge nuggets I'm dropping in my shows and just digging what I'm screaming here, smash that like button and subscribe. And spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. In today's episode, I'll be reviewing some wines from Domaine Bousquet. These wines are provided by my good friends again at Creative Palette. Thank you again, Kate, for sending these wines my way. I reviewed Bousquet wines in the past, but let's revisit their history. This is uh, taken from their information sheet. A 1990 vacation in Argentina was all it took. For third generation winemaker Jean Bousquet, it was love at first sight, the object of the Frenchman's desire, the Guatiare Valley, a scenic remote arid terrain high in the Tupungato district of the Uco Valley in Argentina's Mendoza region, which is close to the border of Chile. Let's have Google Earth show us this area while I hopefully don't stumble over the rest. Here where the condors fly and not a vine in sight, Bousquet discovered his, de his dream terroir, an ideal location in which to nurture organically grown wines. With altitudes ranging up to 5,249 feet, Guateate occupies the highest extremes of Mendoza's viticultural limits. This area is considered to be where some of Mendoza's best wine come from. The same cannot be said when Jean Bousquet first set eyes on this cool climate locale. Back then, it was virgin territory, tracts of semi-desert, nothing planted, no water above ground, no electricity, and a single dirt track by way of access. Locals dismissed the area as too cold for growing grapes. Bousquet, on the other hand, rec reckoned he found the perfect blend between his French homeland for high acidity and cool climate with the New World, sunny with a potentially with a potential for relatively fruit-forward wines. Another distinct plus, land prices at the time were approximately one twenty-fifth of those for property in more established districts in Mendoza. So in 1997, Jean basically sold everything he had back in France, including his winery, to take a chance in this place. Many people, including his daughter, told him he was crazy. He wasn't the first to attempt to build a winery and plant a vineyard there, but what he did that others didn't apparently was to secure the water rights and dig a 495 foot well. This is basically a desert, so water is crucial. Now over time, he sold off over 800 of his initial 988 acres of land he purchased back in 1997. The first vintage was 2005, and today they now have 667 acres under vine, a modern winery that also includes a hospitality area and restaurant. 2005 also saw his son-in-law, Labid al-Amiri, a successful trade with Fidelity, joined Jean to assist in the construction of the winery. In 2008, Jean's daughter, Anne, joined them. In 2011, Anne and Labid became owners of the winery. By the way, their husband and wife, if that didn't, wasn't clear. Here, I've got a before and after photo of the area where the winery is. The before is from 1990 that shows it just a dirt road. The after picture is a current picture of the winery and vineyards with a spectacular backdrop of the Andes Mountains. Not sure if both pictures are taken from the same perspective, especially since the background of the before picture is pretty blown out. But if you look closely, you can see some mountains in the background on the left. For Anne and Labide, sustainability encompasses more than organic fruit or a reduced carbon footprint. It includes economic sustainability for the surrounding community. When the couple set up home in Tupangato, the area was a rural backwater, which it still is, abandoned by a failing central government that necessitated building an infrastructure from scratch. The Bousquets joined an alliance of local wineries in funding construction of a new road providing better access for employees, material deliveries, and a small but growing number of tourists. The couple also immersed themselves in training a workforce new to wine growing and office work. Every detail had to be thought through, from transport for employees who didn't own a car to microloans for continuing education. Today, success stories abound. Domaine Bousquet's head of purchasing, for example, started out as an 18-year-old high school graduate on the bottling line. The wine industry has transformed the Tupangato economy, but Domaine Bousquet was there first, and Anne and Labide count this as among their proudest achievements. All right, so let's talk about high altitude when it comes to wine. The Bousquet Media Pack has a really good write-up on it, and what I've done is condensed it to just the essential points. Vineyards are at 4,000 foot elevation. Vines need moderate temperatures from 68 to 86 degrees 
Fahrenheit ideally. Muscat sheet says 47 to 86. Uh, so too hot or too cold, then the vines shut down. When you get below 50, very little photosynthesis occurs and above 95, it declines rapidly. This is in general around the world. From Bousquet sheet, having the range extend down to 47 would lead me to believe that their conditions allow good photosynthesis to occur below 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Being high altitude also allows a large diurnal shift. 59 degree Fahrenheit shift is not uncommon. It allows higher sugar and higher acid at the same time. Also causes thicker skins, which creates wine with greater body, flavor, and aromatics. The thicker skins is a protection mechanism since you're not since you're getting more UV light. The same thing happens to humans at high altitude. We sunburn easier. 360 sunny days out of the year. Another reason for thicker skins you know, occurring during the growing season. Constant breezes from the Andes helps mitigate heat stress. Since it's not in a valley, soil is less fertile, which is actually important to grow high quality wine grapes. A few other points. Soil is sandy. This provides excellent drainage. Also makes organic farming easier. So low humidity also helps organic farming. There's eight inches of rain per year. Snow melt from the Andes is crucial. It also helps that they have a well. From their media kit, snow melt is used for irrigation. So I imagine the deep well is used for everything else. Today's wines are their Gaia collection. They come from Dome Bousquet's estate vineyards in Tupangato. The name references the ancient Greek goddess of the earth and an inspiration for the Bousquet family from the outset. All right, so let's get into the wines. First, we're gonna have the 2018 Domaine Bousquet Gaia Cabernet Franc. Its suggested retail price is 20 bucks. 100% Cabernet Franc, manual harvesting, cold maceration for 72 hours, which helps extraction. It's temperature controlled fermentation. There's a 14, mas 14 day maceration, so again, extraction. And this is also when fermentation really begins. It's aged for 10 months in French oak. Its alcohol is 15.4%. So it's a big boy. Residual sugar is 2.3 grams per liter. Acidity is 6.07 grams per liter. The pH is 3.6. That's basically a sweet spot for a lot of wines. So let's check it out. All righty. So big fan that, I mean, organic, the organic thing's cool, but a big fan that they're effectively practicing sustainability like kind of how california defines sustainability that it's not just what you do in the vineyard but it's how you operate your business in oregon you see this with like b corp or b corporations uh same idea it's about your whole how you, your whole ecosystem of your winery or just your business not just a winery uh, but a lot of wineries and distilleries and breweries in oregon do that all right so as far as color, let's, uh, let's get some paper here. So it's light staining on the glass. It's, you know, just kind of this um, not quite opaque. I mean, it's, it's pretty opaque. Uh, Ruby-ish color. It's pretty consistent throughout. I know we didn't talk about the tearing last week. Uh, but the tearing, I'm going to call that kind of high. I mean, it's it's pretty thick and it's not moving that much, which it should be. I mean, it's pretty high alcohol. So on the nose, it's not highly aromatic, but you're getting some really good darker fruits out of this. But there's also a um, kind of a rusticity. There's also like an earthiness coming through. But on the fruit, we get some blackberry. There's also a bit of raspberry, black raspberry. We have some violet. You've got, oh, the alcohol started coming through a little bit on the nose there. You've got this um, kind of green tobacco. Like a, like a, Underripe coffee bean, not really a roasted coffee, but like this kind of a little bit of a coffee aroma to it. Fresh tilled earth, some tobacco leaves. Something more on the green side. 
I would say there's a little bit of mint to it. So this is Cabernet Franc, and Cabernet Franc is, tends to have a lot of what we call pyrazinic qualities, which means you get green, and usually it translates to things like bell pepper, maybe jalapeno, that type of stuff. But it can also express itself into other things like mint. There's a bit of fern to it. So you have like a greener type of things. Even though it's aged, uh, what, for 10 months in oak, it's not, it's not over the top. I get a little bit of oak spicing. It didn't specify if it's how much is new as far as 10 months. But I suspect that there's some new oak in here, but I would suspect that it's, not, it's there's also a decent amount of just second, third, first, second, third use oak in this. I know it's not expensive to make wine in Argentina as a general rule, um, and this is 20 bucks, so there could be you know, a decent amount of new oak in this. But remember, French oak is expensive, regardless of what part of the world you're making wine. So all those like hints of green, it was kind of like the teas. It's on the palate. Now, the fruit comes across a little more ripe. So it's, it wasn't like super ripe on the fruit on the nose, but it really now ripens out. And you've got this kind of bell pepper-ish, or like this pepper chili jam that you're getting. It's not jammy fruit necessarily, but like you've got like this, like this blackberry and raspberry kind of compote or jam that's not like super sweet, but just like this, the quality of it, that they, they got a little jalapeno in there, right? So you've got the fruit and the jalapeno mixed together. It's not over the top. And, and while I love green like that in my Cab Franc and my Carmenere and my Cabernet Sauvignon and my, my, my Bordeaux varieties, I really appreciate when it's subtle. Side note, I totally called Shinon at the tasting group today. It was awesome. On that one, I said it tasted like poop covered bell pepper because it did. So in this case, I would go, this is not French because it doesn't smell poopy or taste poopy. But there's a richness to it. The, the oak is, I feel, coming through a little bit more. You've got a vanilla quality. You've got some cinnamon. I don't really get any clove to it. But you've got a little more baking spices to it. So that makes me think that there's a decent amount of new French oak in this. Maybe not 100%, but we've got a good percentage in here going on. It's really It really coats the mouth well. You could drink this on its own but you probably really should be pairing this with some food. So what kind of food you, well, steak. Steak is like the most obvious. Like the tannins aren't like super over the top. I mean, they're there and it really kind of dries out. And it does finish, you know, it has a good sweetness of fruit or ripeness of fruit. There is a little bit of a bitter component at the very end. Um, so I would say something that's, you don't need a ribeye on this, but ribeye would be totally fine with this. You could pretty much any type of, any style of, or cut of steak would work. But something a little bit richer, it doesn't have to be quite like pot roast or brisket, but you could do that. There isn't really any smoke in this wine, but if you were doing this with like a barbecue, that'd be great. Argentina is totally known, and so is Chile, but Argentina especially, is totally known for just having all kinds of different styles of, of steaks and beefs, beef and beef and sausages and all kinds of just meat and grilled too, right? I mean, you go to these, I mean, I know Brazil does, you have these Brazilian steakhouses, right? But, you know, that, that part of South America, you, it's really meat focused. And this is a wine that would perfectly go with any of that type of stuff. Your burgers, I mean, burgers are great. Especially if you had like a little jalapeno burger in there. If you went to Whataburger, which I know there aren't Whataburgers all over the country, but they have like, they have like a hatch, they had like a hatch burger or whatever. So if you had the hatch chili, the hatch chilies.
This is fantastic wine. And it's 20 bucks. That's awesome. So I'm going to leave a little bit in the glass. And we're going to move on to the next wine. So that is the 2018 Domaine Bousquet Gaia Cabernet Sauvignon. It's also 20 bucks. So 100% cab. It's manual harvest again, temperature control fermentation, 15 and 30 day macerations on the text sheet. I don't know what they really mean by that. Maybe there's two different batches that, that you know, one goes through 15 day, one goes through 30 day and it's combined later. I don't know. Uh, it's Asian French oak for eight to 10 months also. It's ABV is 15%. It's RS is 3.02. It's acidity six grams per liter and the pH is 3.73. So a little bit higher in the pH, a little bit lower in the acidity. So let's check it out. As I take the last drops of Loretto. On the wine bottle, not the glass. So I don't really do a lot of cab franc, franc, cab franc or Cabernet Sauvignon from Argentina. It's not a grape that Argentina is necessarily known for. It. They do make it. Uh, they make it in you know a decent amount, decent quantity. But I mean, when you think red wine from Argentina, what do you think Malbec, right? Which, by the way, I totally hosed the Malbec at tasting group today. Though I did call it a Bordeaux variety, so there's that at least. So the color is similar. Like I don't have a lot of color left on. I don't have a lot of wine left on this, but the color is a little bit similar. I'd say this is a little bit deeper on the red, on the ruby. The staining is, actually it looks like it's a little bit less on the staining. It's a little kind of a lighter staining, which, you know, when we talk about, um, All right, you probably saw a little glitch there because, so this is, you know, my remote control for that phone and it like crapped out on me, the remote control. So I was like, oh me, I hope that the uh, app actually didn't stop recording. It's still recording. So we are, we're golden. All right. So anyway, back to the color. You know, there's a little more staining on the glass than I initially thought. It's about the same staining, a little bit more, but we're used to like calves a lot of times having that really from Napa, having that like heavier staining a little more extraction. So, but remember this goes through either 15 and or 30 day maceration. And it doesn't specify if it's like, like maybe 15 days of cold soak maceration. Maybe it's 30 days of maceration of during fermentation. Maybe that's what it is. But, and there's definitely extraction, but it, it seems like it's not as much as I would necessarily expect. But anyway, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go any more about the color. It, the color is fine. All right, so it's not highly aromatic. I would call it a medium on the aromatics. Obviously youthful. So it's a, it's similar to the Cabernet Franc. The it's not jumping out at me. The fruit is a little more muted. It's slightly ripe, but not quite ripe red and black fruit. There also is a bit of, there is actually a bit of smoke to this. So that might be coming from say, if, if the, if the French oak had a heavier toast, it might've translated into some smokiness into the wine. There is the slightest bit of green to it. It's also, there actually there's a little bit of sweet tobacco. I'm getting a little sweetness. Maybe the fruit's becoming, is current, starting to kind of have a little more ripeness to it and a little bit of sweet tobacco. Not a green tobacco, you know, like, like regular, like normal tobacco. But this is a wine where I'd be like, I don't want to smell a whole lot, so let's just get it on the palate and see if it opens up like the first one did too. So what's cool about this wine 
is I feel like it straddles the line between Bordeaux, even though there isn't a lot of 100% Cabernet Sauvignon from Bordeaux, uh, but an older world Cabernet Sauvignon or based wine and say stuff like Napa Valley. Remember, this is not a hot climate. Now it gets lots of sun, so you're gonna get thicker skins, you're gonna get higher tannins, and the tannin here I don't think is really super high. Even with all the macerations going on here, I think the tannin is like totally in balance. I've had other, I've had other Napa cabs, I've had other cabs that the tannins way higher. With that said, as I've been saying that, the tannin is kind of creeping up on me, which sometimes happens for me. Like initially tannin goes, eh, it's not that bad, and then, and it's Barolo, right? And then all of a sudden, like a minute or two later, I'm like, oh, there's the tannin. So that happens to me with tannin sometimes. The aromatics are getting a little bit better. Might be just because I got on the palate and, and my nose is starting to acclimate to that. But anyway, back to the, the palate and this, this combination, this in between, there's a bit of rusticity to it. It's more red fruit than black fruit, but you've got both of them in there. It's more of a, on the green side, it's not really the pepper, like you get the Cabernet Franc. It's kind of like that fern type of thing. It's not even like mint. It's kind of like this leafy green plant type of thing. There's a sweetness to the fruit, but it's also a little more bitter. There's a little bit more coffee to this. There's, the smoke isn't as prominent on the palate as it was on the nose. This is a wine I think would do really well to kind of sit out for a while. Like if you truly decanted it or you put it through like a Venturi or you got the adapter, even though I said I don't need the adapter. If you did the adapter on this for like the quick pop and pour, I think it would totally benefit from a little more air. I think the wine is a little bit tight right now. I think the Cabernet Franc was a lot more expressive immediately, whereas this one's just kind of going, no nah, man, I need to trust you. I don't know if I can open up all the way. I think that's what this, this wine is like, you kind of go, come on, man. Like, like, talk to me. Talk to me, Goose, except Goose dies. Anyway. I mean, every sip is a little more complex. You get a little more broadness. You get a little more of everything just kind of turned up another notch of everything I've already said. So those red fruits, the black fruits. Yeah, that 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 kind of fern type of quality. It's not like I said, not really like pepper, but that other that otherness of green is really starting to come through a little bit more. A little bit of leafiness to it, a little bit of uh, uh, tobacco. Not quite green tobacco, but I can see a little green tobacco, but a little more of the regular tobacco on that. The coffee's there. It's a little more bitter element. Kind of a dark, bitter chocolate too on that. Like if I was tasting this wine, I would be a little confused as to where this came from. I would be probably pretty certain that it was Cabernet Sauvignon, but I also could see going, I'm not really sure exactly, but I'd be, I'd be going, this has gotta be cab or cab based or something similar, but I wouldn't necessarily know where it came from. I would probably throw it into Chile. And considering we're really just across the mountains from Chile, that would not be a bad call. Because it has enough new worldness to keep me away from Bordeaux. I like the wine. Now I'll be honest, I like the Cab Franc better. There's just some more check boxes for it for me on that. Let's taste a little more of this again. This one's growing on me, but I'm gonna go back to the Cabernet Franc. And he's a little more approachable early on. I think this Cabernet Sauvignon could either just sit in the bottle, literally could sit in the bottle for a little bit longer, or it could just be decanted and kind of sit out for like an hour. I think it would really, really open up. The Cabernet Franc is like, 
it's ready to go. It's like, I'm here to party, let's go. And this guy's like, nah, man, I, I need a couple drinks in me first and then I'm ready to go. Um, this is more the reserve, the thing of the quiet. This is the quiet, silent, strong type, right? And this one's the, hey man, I'm here, let's, 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 let's get going. I like the wine a lot, I really do. But I'd like to see what would happen over the next hour and I'm not gonna be doing that right now. But I think when I try this wine again at a later date, when I probably just open the bottle and have it say with dinner, that'd be good. And that's, that's another thing, I, I didn't really talk about it yet. On the food, you definitely need a, a richer food. The tannin is definitely higher. Like as I was drinking it and tasting it, the tannin really was starting to come through a lot more. So I would say well-marbled steaks, richer foods, pot roast, prime rib. You know, most of the fat is rendered out in prime rib. Um, you know, something that has bacon in it, that kind of stuff. Something that's richer in, in, in quality with food. You know, ribs, that kind of stuff, right? Totally you can see the pizza. I mean, you got all the cheese in there, all the, all the fat from cheese. You need pizzas, especially like maybe like a margarita pizza, which is, you know, really just a lot of stuff for the tannins to play with. And that pyrazine is really starting to come through a little bit more. It's not as much as a Cap Franc, but it was start, it's starting to kind of get down that pepper uh, pathway. So. This wine is, is like one of those scenes where, like I said, it's got a lot of layers and it just needs some more time. It seems more time to open up, which I get. When I do this stuff with, with Corvin, I'm not like opening up and decanting it and all that because honestly, I, I know these are free wines for me, but I don't want, I, I want to enjoy these wines. When I record, in this case, two episodes in one day, I have four wines. I don't want four wines opened up that I'm vacuuming and it's going to take me, I may not want to drink anything tomorrow. Highly unlikely since I'm off work, but I may not want to have anything. I may not, you know, I may want to like hold off a couple days on having anything far as wine. So the Corvin allows me to set it and forget it. And if I come back six months and want some of this, I can do that because that, that, that happens. I get distracted or I kind of forget I had a wine. I just kind of put it away. I'm like, oh, wow, I have that wine. And it's awesome. I love being able to do that. All right, so that's gonna do that's gonna do it for today. Again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends. And then until next time, I have no wine left, but salute.